pomeriggio a tutti. Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Good afternoon everybody. Surprised by simple facts. Well, you must admit that this is a good expression. This is a good expression also because it shows a certain kind of intelligence, a certain way of looking at things. Well, the important thing is not to take things for granted. So being open to be surprised by anything, even by simple facts, any kind of knowledge, especially when it comes to scientific research, sort of needs this uh, amazement, uh, this wonder for simple facts. Actually, when it comes to science, the more questions are simple, the more they require complex and uh, deep answers. So answers need to be powerful, especially when the questions are simple. We are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the publication of the theory of relativity of Einstein. Well, the underlying basic questions are very simple. What is space? What is time? What is gravity? The more questions are fundamental, the more what is at stake is important. So, well, when it comes to today's encounter, so there is a lot at stake, really a lot, because we're not going to talk about uh, the incredibly small or big of the universe. We're going to talk about another abyss of mystery, a great mystery, maybe the greatest mystery of all in nature. So ourselves, men, the level of nature where nature becomes awareness of reality, as Don Giussani said. From a physical point of view, human beings, and particularly our brain, is the most complex entity we know. Oddly enough, this incredible level of complexity is also the place of the simplest experiences, the most simple experiences occur there because uh, actually it's thanks to our brain that we can relate to the surrounding environment, to reality we live through. So we can experience reality through talking. So talking and the speech is the physical deed letting man relate to reality. And so speech and language are the specific topic of today's meeting. So there is no other sort of more mysterious and magical ability than speaking, talking. So what is behind the mystery of language and specifically to what extent science, as we know it, as we conceive it, has the right tools to understand this incredible ability men have. Surprised by simple facts. So this beautiful expression was devised by our great guest of today, Professor Noam Chomsky. Well, Professor Chomsky actually doesn't need 
and introduction and presentation is Emeritus Professor of Linguistics at MIT of Boston. New York Times defined him probably as the greatest living intellectual and, uh, and greatest scholar. And the Arts and Humanities Citation Index is sad that his name is among the 10 most quoted names of the 20th century. So after Freud and before Hegel. Today, Professor Chomsky is with us. Well, actually, he is not with us physically, because last week, unfortunately, he had a little sort of home uh, accident. Uh, he has three broken ribs. So, so thank you very much indeed, because you're still aching, Professor. But in spite of that, you decided to join us. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Chomsky for being with us in spite of uh, not uh, feeling perfectly well. So it's really a great, great privilege for us to host uh, Professor Chomsky at the meeting in Rimini. And your participation is really unique and everything happened through a personal encounter and that uh, was due to a personal sort of relationship and encounter with Andrea Moro, Professor Moro. And Professor Moro is another internationally renowned linguist expert. He has been a scholar and uh, a pupil of Professor Chomsky for years. I've been uh, knowing him for years, and uh, he has done a lot of research. So again, everything happens through encounters, also at the meeting. So meetings are at the heart of the meeting in Rimini. So mating is about a network of relationships. Uh, and so Andrea Moro will introduce Professor Chomsky during his speech. And at the same time, Professor Moro will take us by hand to start talking about the main subject being discussed. So Andrea is a full professor of general linguistics at the Institute for Advanced Study, IUSS of Pavia in Italy. He has been visiting scientist at Harvard University and MIT for many years and is still collaborating with Professor Chomsky at MIT. He published several scientific articles and also several books that are really fascinating. He wrote about language, and uh, his last book is the new edition of I Confini di Babele. And is also one of the top world experts of theoretical syntax and neurobiological correlates of human language. And, uh, well, is going to tell us more about two discoveries, actually. And one is a very recent uh, discovery. So this is a, a sort of, uh, let's say, taste of something really very new. Thank you very much, Marco. Hello, Professor Chomsky. Hello, Noam. So I can finally feel how uh, sort of the rock bands playing before the Rolling Stones or the Beatles could feel before the so big gig of a great band. So I'm here like a sort of, uh, let's say, an artist playing before the big artist, the greatest star. So as Marco said, everything stemmed from a sentence that I translated when I was younger from one of Chomsky's books. I understood from the start that his studies were extremely important also in terms of uh, scientific methodology. And it is important to be uh, ready to be surprised by simple facts. So that's a key sentence to me. There are three key elements. So learn, surprise, and simple facts. So 
these three words have important repercussions because if you can learn, you can teach something. So that means that the others can be involved and share knowledge. Secondly, surprise is very important. And as Marco knows, being surprised means being sort of ready to accept what is unexpected what cannot be foreseen. And third, simplicity, because uh, uh, simple questions are usually at the origin of revolutionary theories. However, well, my role here today is to sort of uh, present uh, somehow the topic that is going to be dealt by Professor Chomsky and also to uh, make her understand the importance of his work. And I decided to quote something that perfectly depicts uh, the early years of Chomsky. We are in the 50s at the MIT in Boston. Well, as you know, in the 50s, uh, well, uh, the ideas stemming from the uh, after World War period came to the day. There were bi molecular biology studies, and then there were other sort of system decoding secret codes automatically. So several are interesting theories. So the day at that time, plus the formal logic. But let's hear what an eyewitness says about those years at the MIT. So at the lab, there was the conviction that the new knowledge of cybernetics and thanks to the new technologies of information science, we were about fully understanding the complexity of communication in animals and machines. So full understanding man, mach uh, sorry, animals, machine. So if you analyze the language from this perspective, so the specificity of human language seems to be lost forever. We have uh, uh, animals on the one hand and machines on the other hand. So men are not even quoted in this sentence. So this way of seeing sort of the human language is not neutral. This corresponds to a form of ideological pollution that sometimes occurs. Well, I won't make many quotes, but again, this is underscored by Lederberg, a great American scholar that wrote a key text on on the biological fundamental elements of language. It said that uh, a rich biological study on language appears necessary, especially if you state that languages are made of cultural conventions that are totally arbitrary. So there is an endless bubble situation. And so again, this is a metaphor that somehow is quite a sort of a uh, I mean, abrupt, uh, and uh, we also discover that uh, this is, was not that new. But let's see who really overturned the reality of scientific no knowledge. Well, it was Noam Chomsky who put together three apparent independence of elements. So the complexity of grammar. So there is no full description of a human language grammar for the time being. If you observe all the languages of the world, all of them have share a core of common rules. And third, when you learn a language, more or less, as a child, as first native language, well, it takes more or less at the same time all over the world. And so that book saw the day, Syntactic Structures. And uh, as you can see, if you remember what I just said, so this overturns the situation because uh, the fact that all normal kids acquire sort of comparable grammars, uh, learn comparable grammars with the same level of complexity and at the same time means that human beings are designed in a special way with a specific mysterious ability. So not only men are back on the scene, but also men, I mean, are considered uh, as children and their abilities. 
And so we have a keyword project, and then for the first time, we have this term mysterious that is going to come back again and again. And it's going to come back in the lecture that uh, Professor Chomsky is going to deliver in a few minutes. So this is the main framework of this real revolution in the world of studying language. So languages, I mean, are somehow uh, biologically determined. So this is the starting idea. Well, how can you better develop that idea? First of all, we need to objectively study languages. I want to show you what uh, linguistics is about. Uh, so, well, this is not uh, a sort of, uh, you know, knitting study. I don't know if you can just uh, see what I'm showing. So this is not uh, a crochet hook course. Yeah, so if we assign figures uh, to the vertical and the horizontal elements, we can describe this element. So we see we have a purple element, red element, and so on and so forth. And then, well, when I used to go to museums, uh, when I was a child, I used to look uh, behind uh, pieces of tapestry and you see behind that uh, elements that seem to be a sort of separate actually are one single element sort of being intertwined and woven. So I tried to look at the pattern on the back of the tapestry, trying to find back all the threads. So trying to find a pattern behind uh, the words. That's what the Professor Chomsky did and somehow it destroyed the idea of, uh, let's say, an infinite bubble of languages. So language is a set of values, of specific values and parameters within uh, a sort of invariant system of principles. And uh, I think that uh, this is uh, an excellent sentence. And there is another important thing to be considered. So the study on human languages uh, could not be applied to animal languages because syntax is the human ability to give a meaning. This is a unique human factor. If I say sort of kill and uh, if uh, we sort of say then Cain and uh, Abel, if I say Abel, Cain and kill, we can uh, make up different sentences and have different meanings. We can say Cain killed Abel or Abel killed Cain. And so Steve Anderson said that animal communication systems are based on a limited and fixed system of discrete messages. So then in the past, uh, there was a try to teach language to chimpanzee and uh, the sign language, and they realized that chimpanzee, so these monkeys, actually can master a high number of uh, words, but uh, these chimpanzees, so which are made up 19,000 sentences, but uh, they could not express any meaning. I mean, this is... Uh, um, just to tell you the level of impact of uh, generative grammar and also this new way of looking at language. But actually, the most disruptive element of any new theory is to stimulate new questions. And I really want to show you to what extent Chomsky's theories opened up new avenues of research in a quite revolutionary way. Let's see the new questions which were behind these new research style. We know that the language depends from the brain. And uh, I mean, uh, Tan Tan is the brain of a young boy, a person who had a severe injury on the frontal lobe and had been hospitalized in a French hospital. You could say only Tan, so that's why it was called Tan Tan. And uh, Dr. Brocard, and uh, this area was later uh, named the Brocard area, shows that language and the brains are strictly intertwined. And so imagine the consequences of this question. So 
do grammar rules depend on the brain? So this was a key question. Okay, we can answer to this question in many ways. I could start uh, with a theoretical approach, but actually I want to go on by asking you a specific question. Why is it so that uh, actually all possible conceivable rules are not re realized and applied in the world languages? So, I mean, we could make up any grammar rule. Let's see, for instance, what I'm meaning. Let's see, I mean, uh, what happens in the brain. Let's imagine two sentences. Uh, Pietro reads li books and my brother reads books. In Italian, we say Pietro doesn't read any books. If we came from another planet and were to learn Italian from a grammar, well, we could say, well, we see that uh, Pietro doesn't read any books, uh, is uh, sort of uh, built differently from uh, uh, Pietro le uh, reads books, uh, say, but again, we is sort of are able to sort of uh, formulate these sentences in a quite spontaneous way, so no language in the world uh, fixes uh, some specific uh, rules about uh, sentence creation starting from uh, a, a certain word. Okay, so let's see this map behind me. It's like an upside down globe. Here you see the place of origin of our species, Western Africa, and then you have migration flows. We could say that, uh, well, uh, the first language had a certain set of rules and that uh, the uh, languages that were invented next uh, tried to imitate this first language. This could be plausible, but this is not the only explanation. And so, well, as a student and scientist, I started developing a new theory and so, a new perspective was developed. Once a friend of mine told me this is the only time in the history of men when we can try to have a look at the world from above the clouds. Well, this is a good metaphor because actually we can now see how the brain works with in vivo models. So what did we do? So we took all the ingredients that we had. So we took uh, uh, option one, so the first speculation maybe all the languages of the world were not so much uh, uh, infinite. We took then, uh, there was a core, a commonly shared core, then we took a group of speakers and we told them specific languages. And then we double checked what happened in that specific area of the brain to see how the brain reacted to those uh, rules. And then my sort of uh, uh, passion for this topic uh, suggested me to come up and uh, uh, create uh, impossible uh, grammars of uh, non-existent languages. So there is a complex theory, mathematical theory behind that. I tried to recap all this in a chart to be clearer. So on the one hand, we have the mastering of a language. So let's imagine that you get some homework and uh, you need to build a certain number of sentences and you can be more or less good or more or less bad. If you get uh, a zero score, you're very bad. If you get 10, you are very good. Then we checked uh, the blood circulation level in the Broca area. That is the area directly dependent uh, and intertwined with language. And it was very important to work with Stefano Kappa, a neurologist that, uh, in a way, believed my theories and decided to work with me. Let's have a look at the results with possible rules 
the more I'm good, the more the brachial area sort of pumps blood. With the possible rules, the opposite happens. So uh, the brain is able to make the distinction between possible and impossible rules spontaneously. So this is an empirical test of the fact that languages are not cultural arbitrary variations. So this is an evidence. And so we cannot control in a sort of specific way the neuron activity. So this is a first fact, a first result. So in the 50s, Chomsky sort of stated that simply by observing the languages. But if you have a look at the neurobiological structure of the brain, we get evidence. So grammars are not a neutral software running on a sort of inert hardware. So grammars are an expression of a specific nature. But every time you come across a structure, you can ask yourself so where that structure comes from. And then there is another topic that probably will be extremely interesting in the next years for neuroscientists is understanding where does the structures in our brains come from, especially when it comes to language. There is one possibility. So admitting that grammars actually get the orders of information from the structures of the world, singular and plural, come from the fact that we can distinguish uh, things that are countable or uncountable, singular or plural. But do all rules come from the world and the reality of the world? No. Maybe we can be a similarity with the mathematics and music, but they develop later in children. So we should then have uh, the a reverse theory telling us to what extent mathematics and music depend on language structures. But we need to move on to a more radical question. So what do you exchange language neurons? So we need to shift from the where, so an area, to the what. So what do neurons communicate? So please bear with me for a second and try to think about the evolution that we had since the 50s. Lederberg said that it is impossible to study the language from a biological point of view because it's just a cultural convention. But you see, we have come to a different stage. We are now not at the where rules are activated in the brain, but which is the single piece of knowledge that is transmitted by the neurons when you are trying, for instance, to decode linguistic content expressed by a human being. So the radical question is, I mean, the language is made of what? Of, uh, I mean, of rules, of sounds, of letters, but what else? So, I mean, the language lives inside and outside of our brain, of our mind. We have airwaves, airwaves that are sort of uh, uh, let's say, produced by us when I speak. If I stop producing these airwaves, well, I stop speaking. Okay, you so nothing was getting out of my mouth. And inside, which is the possibility then? So the language somehow can be converted into electric waves. So in other words, human language is physically made of waves. So again, here you see that uh, simple questions is the best scientific methodology ever. So which is the connection between these two kinds of waves, uh, the outside waves and the inside waves? And here you see the history of a last experiment, the last one I'm going to talk about, that uh, results directly from uh, the language analysis devised by Professor Chomsky. So to what extent uh, the waves of which uh, the human language is made uh, do uh, resemble each other? So the first uh, trivial answer is that, of course, uh, it is self-evident if uh, sound waves come into my brain, so probably maybe the electric waves uh, inside my brain reproduce uh, what uh, uh, is out of the brain. But what about uh, uh, sort of language production? Because if you uh, listen to me, I'm producing something with my voice. So now 
I am uh, talking. I'm. Uh, what is the kind of electric wave that I generate when I'm about to speak? And here we have another surprise. Well, at least as far as I'm concerned, maybe this is the most surprising surprise of all. That one that leaves you gobsmacked because you think, oh my gosh, why did I think about it beforehand? And everything, I mean, seems to be so easy, so clear. So I didn't pray any saint. I didn't pray a specific saint to get to that. But uh, I will uh, tell you what uh, Saint Augustine wrote when Ambrogio used to read. So when he used to read, his eyes were about to follow the letters on the page, but his word was silent and his tongue was still. So Saint Augustine describes what Saint Ambrogius used to do when reading silently, and this is fascinating. And let's leave behind uh, the historic context. Uh, and he says, but his voice was silent. And uh, what he acknowledges in Ambrogio is so important that he makes up uh, a word, uh, uh, a uh, sort of uh, inner monologue or oral hallucination. So what happens inside the brain of a person when you talk without uttering any sound? We do it with a neurosurgical technique, trying to understand what happens on the brain cortex of patients that, of course, I mean, were facilitated somehow because then when surgically treated, there were no damages uh, provoked by the cutting of the cortex. So we saw exactly what happens when the language remains inside the brain. I think that everybody of us, when we read, when we think, we think about the words uh, with their sound. So here you see two charts, and uh, they're very complex. So Professor Laforgue, that was invited to the meeting, once said a sentence, I don't remember if he said it in San Marino or here, but he said once, mathematics is difficult because it's human, or the other way around. But, I mean, things are difficult, and you have to accept it. But this is the chart of the cortex activity when I talk out loud, and here when I talk silently. As you can see, the chart has the same signs. So, again, when all logic solutions are to be excluded, the logical solution is the right one. So after three years of work and 16 subjects, we have concluded that even in the absence of, uh, of sound, the electric waves of the neurons reproduce the sound waves. And then I saw if the brains can recognize between sounds and sentences. But what I want to say in conclusion is that the surprising result that we got is the following. We couldn't uh, sort of understand uh, why is it so that neurons produce sound waves even though there is no voice production. You may uh, sort of maybe help an aphasic patient who has just a peripheral damage or you may take out a secret of a person who doesn't want to talk and speak and spill the beans. But well, how you use a discovery depends on how you want to work and what you want to obtain. And uh, Professor Chomsky's role on the students was key. Look at these uh, sorts of page. Well, I think that uh, this is quite remarkable. Chomsky, at that time, opposed violently well, with words to the war in Vietnam. And again, discoveries like this one are somehow discoveries that then have uh, accountability related repercussions. But again, the borders of bubble are the product of the human brain architecture, and neurons communicate through waves that are produced also when a, a, a man is silent. There is a, 
uh, Baroque like painter of the 17th century. One uh, is one of his paintings is uh, at the Uffizi, Uffizi Museums in Florence. Look at this uh, painting. You see a painter watching his face in a mirror and reproduces this face on a canvas. I think this is the same thing. So you see the language outside, you reproduce it, but you cannot uh, look at the face of the author, so yourself. Well, what else can I say? Uh, we are going through very special times. Uh, I would simply like to uh, conclude by saying this magic number, 1491. 1491, so the dawn of the brain discovery well, again, we still have a lot to discover and a lot to understand, but let's not forget that 1491 marked also the persecution of the Jews from Europe. I mean, they were kicked off Europe and also the Sultanate of Granada was totally destroyed. And so I was a student of Professor Chomsky and uh, I would like uh, to give my contribution and uh, I hope uh, to witness many other important discoveries in my life. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Moro. Thank you very much, Professor Moro, for introducing this fascinating topic we are already carried away totally in this mysterious world and so now i would like to ask professor chomsky to so share with us his presence so the floor is yours professor Thank you very much. Uh, I should say that uh, we're sorry that we cannot be with you in person. Uh, my wife and I had been looking forward very much to participating in this very significant event. Uh, an unfortunate accident made that impossible and we're uh, deeply disappointed uh, not to be able to be with you, except uh, indirectly. Uh, I'd like to say a few things about uh, what kind of uh, I don't think I'm supposed to be speaking. Yes, eighty-eight. Uh, my turn. <laughs> uh, I'd, uh, I'm sorry that. Uh, I can't be with you directly today in person. Uh, my wife and I had been very much uh, looking forward to participating in these uh, very significant events. Uh, we we're deeply disappointed that an um, unfortunate uh, minor accident made it impossible. So we'll do the best under these circumstances. Uh, I'd like to say some things about uh, uh, the question of uh, what kind of creatures human beings are, what are their distinctive properties, uh, what can we hope to understand uh, about these topics and uh, other aspects of the world, and what may uh, literally be beyond our cognitive capacities, our capacities to come to comprehend these matters. Uh, from the uh, earliest days of the modern scientific revolution, there has been intense interest in human language, recognized to be the core feature of human nature and the primary capacity distinguishing modern humans from other creatures. Uh, in a contemporary interpretation, uh, Ian Tattersall, one of the leading students of human evolution, 
writes that the acquisition of the uniquely modern human sensibility was an abrupt and recent event, and the expression of this new sensibility was almost certainly crucially abetted by the invention of what is perhaps the single most remarkable thing about our modern selves, language. Uh, centuries earlier, Galileo and the 17th century Port Royal logicians and grammarians were awed by what they called the marvelous invention of a means to construct from 25 or 30 sounds that infinity of expressions which bear no resemblance to what takes place in our minds, yet enable us to reveal to others everything that we think and all the various movements of our soul. Uh, Descartes uh, took this capacity to be an essential difference between humans and any animal machine, and it was uh, the primary basis for his uh, mind-body dualism. The great uh, humanist Wilhelm von Humboldt pondered the fact that language somehow involves infinite use of finite means. The last great representative of this tradition was Otto Jespersen, century later, century ago. Uh, he, uh, he too was puzzled by the capacity, the human capacity, to frame free expressions that are typically new to speaker and hearer. And a still deeper problem, he wrote, is to unearth the great principles underlying the grammars of all languages, and by so doing, to gain a deeper insight into the innermost nature of human language and of human thought. Uh, such ideas sound much less strange today than they did during the structuralist behavioral science era that came to dominate much of the field, uh, marginalizing the leading ideas and concerns of the tradition. Uh, throughout this rich tradition of reflection and inquiry, there were efforts to comprehend how humans can freely and creatively employ an infinity of expressions to express their thoughts in ways that are appropriate to circumstances, but not determined by them, which is a crucial distinction. However, the tools were not available to make much progress in carrying these ideas forward. Uh, this uh, difficulty was partially overcome by uh, the middle of the 20th century, uh, thanks to the work of the great mathematicians who laid the basis for the theory of computability. Uh, these accomplishments provided a very clear understanding of how finite means can generate an infinity of expressions. And that opened the way to formulate and investigate what we may consider to be the basic property of human language, a finite generative procedure represented in the brain which yields an infinity of hierarchically structured expressions, uh, each of which has sound and meaning. In more technical terms, each internally generated expression has a determinate interpretation at two interfaces, the sensory motor interface for externalization in one or another sensory modality, usually, though not necessarily speech, and secondly, the semantic interface for reflection, interpretation, inference, planning, and other mental acts. Uh, Nothing analogous to the basic property, uh, even remotely similar, has been discovered in any other organism, uh, lending substance to the judgments of the rich tradition. 
It's important to recognize that the unbounded use of these finite means, the actual production of speech in the free and creative ways that intrigued the great figures of the past, uh, that still remains a mystery. That's not only true for use of language, but for voluntary action generally. The mystery is graphically described by two of the most prominent scientists who study voluntary motion, Emilio Bizzi, Robert Ajaman, uh, reviewing the state of the art today, they write that we have some idea as to the intricate design of the puppet and the puppet strings, but we lack insight into the mind of the puppeteer, uh, what makes it happen. That's not a slight problem. It lies at the borders of feasible scientific inquiry, or perhaps beyond, in a domain that human intelligence cannot penetrate. And if we are willing to accept the fact that we are organic creatures, not angels, we will join leading thinkers of the past in recognizing that some problems may be, be permanent mysteries for us. We will then join Descartes, uh, Newton, Locke, Hume, and other leading figures of the scientific and philosophical traditions. It's worthwhile, I think, to contemplate these concerns, which arose in a dramatic way in the classic moments of modern science. The core principle of the Galilean revolution was what was called the mechanical philosophy, mechanical science, which held that the world is a machine, a complex version of the intricate devices that were then being produced by skilled artisans, which captured the scientific imagination much as computers do today. Accordingly, Galileo insisted that scientific theories are acceptable only if we can duplicate their posits by means of appropriate artificial devices. That was a conception maintained by Descartes, Leibniz, Huygens, Newton, other great figures of the scientific revolution. Descartes believed that he had presented the general outlines of a mechanical theory of the world, though he found one crucial exception to his system, the human language capacity, the ability of every human, but no animal or machine, to understand and use an unbounded number of linguistic expressions in a manner appropriate to circumstances but not caused by them. Again, a crucial distinction. In the terms that were used by later Cartesians, the speaker may be incited or inclined by circumstances, but not compelled by them. One of Newton's great achievements was to undermine the conclusion. Uh, Newton refuted the mechanical philosophy. He showed that the world is not a machine. To account for motion, Newton was compelled to introduce the unintelligible concept of action at a distance, and he was condemned by distinguished scientists uh, for reverting to the so-called occult qualities of the scholastics, and Newton agreed that his basic explanatory concept was an absurdity that no serious scientist could entertain. And he sought for the rest of his life to overcome the absurdity, but failed, as have his successors. The only rational conclusion was that our understanding of the world must inevitably fall short of the criterion of intelligibility established by the founders of modern science. Modern science. Uh, since the world is indeed unintelligible to us, the sciences must seek more modest objectives to construct successful theories of the world. 
This was, I think, a moment of great significance in intellectual history, uh, more so than often recognized. It was, however, recognized by the great thinkers of the period. Uh, David Hume described Newton as the greatest and rarest genius that ever arose for the ornament and instruction of the species. Well, while he seemed to draw the veil from some of the mysteries of nature, he showed at the same time the imperfections of the mechanical philosophy and therefore restored nature's ultimate secrecy, secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. Uh, John Locke understood Newton to have shown that we remain in incurable ignorance of what we desire to know about matter and its effects. And Locke carried his recognition of the impossibility of understanding the world an important step uh, beyond uh, adopting the standard theological framework of the day. He concluded that just as God has added to matter such inconceivable properties as gravitational attraction, he might also have super added to matter the capacity of thought. Uh, replacing God by nature opens the topic to inquiry, a path that was pursued extensively in the 18th century, uh, leading to the conclusion that thought is a property of certain organized form, forms of organized matter. Uh, as uh, Charles Darwin restated the fairly common understanding, there is no need to regard thought, a secretion of the brain, as more wonderful than gravity, a property of matter. Inconceivable to us, but that's not a fact about the external world, or rather a fact about our cognitive limitations, the limits of our capacity to understand. Uh, borrowing from the eloquent announcement of this conference, we should be moved and provoked in the face of that lack that we recognize in ourselves and in all men and women. In this case, a deep cognitive limitation, our inability to penetrate what David Hume recognized to be the ultimate secrets that reside in that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. The idea that there should be limits to human understanding is often taken today to be a reversion to mysticism. It's a heresy dismissed as Mysterianism. A better term than Mysterianism, I think, would be truism. Uh, if we are part of the biological world, then our capacities will have a certain scope, and the same intrinsic nature that provides the scope will also impose limits. That is true of every biological capacity. The real mysticism is the belief that our capacity to understand is boundless. And as I have mentioned, the list of Mysterians is long and distinguished, and they have had good reasons. Uh, returning to Descartes, his concept of body collapsed, and with it, any clear concept of material or physical, but his concepts of mind resisted the Newtonian critique. Uh, in particular, his observations about the creative use of language appear to be correct. For Descartes and others, this human capacity was a particularly clear illustration of the general property of freedom of thought, uh, what Descartes called the noblest thing we have, uh, adding that there is nothing we comprehend more evidently and more perfectly, and it would be absurd to doubt this intimate comprehension and experience merely because it conflicts with something else, 
which we know must by its nature be incomprehensible to us. Descartes' general stance sounds quite cred credible today. But to repeat the conclusion of Bitsi and Ajaman, despite progress in understanding the puppet and the strings, the puppeteer remains a complete mystery. Returning to Humboldt's af aphorism that language involves infinite use of finite means, a great deal has been learned about the means, but the creative use remains a mystery, uh, perhaps forever. Uh, the study of the finite means used in linguistic behavior, that is, the puppet and the strings, uh, that has been pursued very successfully since the mid-20th century in what has come to be called the generative enterprise, a drawing from and contributing to the cognitive revolution that has been underway during this period. The kinds of questions that students are investigating today could not even have been formulated not many years ago, and there has been a vast explosion uh, in study of the languages of the world of the widest typological variety uh, which have come under investigation and have done so at a level of depth never before contemplated in the long and rich history of investigation of language since classical Greece and ancient India. There have been many discoveries along the way, regularly raising new problems and opening new directions of inquiry. The generative enterprise takes a language to be an internal system, a module of the mind, analogous to a biological organ. Each language satisfies the basic property of human language that I mentioned earlier. Uh, Jesperson's great principles underlying the grammars of all language, all languages, are the topic of what has come to be called universal grammar, UG, adapting a traditional term to a new framework, now interpreted as a theory of the genetic endowment for the faculty of language, the innate factors that determine the class of possible human languages. There is, by now, substantial evidence that universal grammar is a species property, uniform among humans, apart from severe pathology, and with no close analog in the rest of the animal world. Uh, this capacity seems to have emerged quite recently in evolutionary time, probably within the last 100,000 years. And we can be fairly confident that it has not evolved since our ancestors began to leave Africa some 60,000 years ago. If so, then the emergence of language, of the language faculty, it was quite sudden in evolutionary time, which leads us to suspect that the basic property should be very simple. Uh, furthermore, since Eric Lenberg's pioneering work in the 1950s, evidence has been accumulating that the human language faculty is dissociated from other cognitive capacities. Uh, that too suggests that whatever emerged quite suddenly should be quite simple. The structuralist and behavioral science approaches of the first half of the 20th century led to the belief that the field of study of language faced no fundamental problems. The methods of analysis were available that provided the means to reduce a corpus of materials to an organized form that was taken to be the primary task of the discipline. The problems of phonology, which was the major focus of inquiry, seem to be largely understood. And these beliefs made sense within the prevailing framework, as did the widely held conception 
that languages can differ from one another without limit and in unpredictable ways, so that the study of each language must be approached without any pre-existent scheme of what a language must be. I'm quoting from a leading theoretical structural linguist. Uh, these beliefs collapsed as soon as the first efforts to construct generative grammars were undertaken by mid-20th century. It quickly became clear that very little was known about human language, uh, even the languages that had been well studied. And it be also became clear that many of the fundamental properties of language that were unearthed must arrive in substantial part from the innate human language faculty, since they are acquired with little or in some cases no evidence. Hence, there must be sharp and determinate limits to what a language can be. Uh, furthermore, many of the properties that were revealed with the first efforts to construct rules satisfying the basic principle posed serious puzzles, some of them still alive today, along with many new ones that continue to be unearthed. In the early days of the generative enterprise, it seemed necessary to attribute great complexity to universal grammar in order to capture the empirical phenomena of languages. It was always understood, however, that this cannot be correct. Universal grammar must have evolved, and the more complex its assumed character, the greater the burden on any account of how it might have evolved. From the earliest days, there were efforts to reduce the assumed complexity of universal grammar while maintaining, often extending, its empirical coverage. And over the years, there have been significant steps in this direction. But by the early 1990s, it seemed to a number of researchers that it might be possible to approach the problems in a new way by constructing an ideal solution and asking how closely it can be approximated by a careful analysis of linguistic data, an approach that has been called the minimalist program. Languages are computational systems and ideally should meet conditions of minimal computation. The natural starting point in this endeavor is to identify the simplest computational operation that would satisfy the basic property. And the choice is quite clear. Every unbounded computational system includes, in some form, an operation that selects two objects already constructed and forms from them a new object. And in the simplest case, the two objects are not modified in this operation, and no new properties are introduced, in particular order, a matter of particular significance. Now, this operation is called merge in recent literature. I'll skip technicalities, but it's easy to show that merge has two possible outcomes. It can form phrases like read books from the two elements read and books. And more interestingly, it can form such phrases as which book will John read from the phrase John will read which book by extracting the phrase which book and merging it with the entire phrase John will read which book. Uh, more precisely, the operation yields which book John will read which book with two copies of the merged element, which book. That yields at once the correct semantic interpretation. Which is the book such that John will read that book? The rules that externalize this to the sensory motor system add linear order, prosody, detailed phonetic properties, and they delete the lower copy of which book 
so that what is actually produced is which book will John read. It's important to note that throughout, the operations described satisfy minimal computation. And that includes the deletion operation and externalization that sharply reduces the computational and articulatory load. Uh, to put it graphically, what reaches the mind has the right semantic form, but what reaches the ear has gaps that have to be filled in by the hearer. These so-called filler gap problems pose significant complications for parsing and perception. In such cases, language is well designed for thought, but poses difficulties for language use. That's an important observation that generalizes quite widely. Uh, notice that what reaches the mind lacks order, while what reaches the ear is ordered. Linear order, then, should not enter into the internal syntactic semantic computations. Rather, it's imposed by externalization, presumably as a reflex of properties of the sensory motor system, which requires linearization. We cannot speak in parallel. We cannot articulate structures. The general property of language illustrated by these cases is that linguistic rules are invariably structure dependent. They depend on structure, not on order. This principle is so strong that when there is a conflict between the computationally simple property of minimal linear distance and the more complex computational property of minimal structural distance, the latter, the more complex one, is invariably selected. That's an important and puzzling fact, which was observed when early efforts to construct generative grammars were undertaken. The answer must be that the simple computation is not available to the system that construct, computes the semantic interpretation. For the child acquiring language, the possibility of using the simple linear computation never arises. And that actually follows from two very plausible assumptions. First, language is perfectly designed, satisfying the principle of minimal computation, hence using unordered merge for computation. Secondly, Externalization to the sensory motor system is an ancillary, a secondary property of language. It reflects properties of the output system which have nothing to do with language. This thesis of perfect design has been called the strong minimalist thesis. And not many years ago, it would have appeared to be so absurd that it was never contemplated. Uh, in recent years, however, evidence has been mounting that suggests that it may hold in quite significant ways. And if we accept this thesis, we at once have an explanation for a number of quite puzzling phenomena. One is the ubiquity in language of displacement. That means interpretation of a phrase where it appears as well as in another position in which its basic semantic role is determined, as in the case of which book will John read. Now, this phenomenon always appeared to require mechanisms that were an imperfection of language design. Uh, under the assumption of op optimal design, however, as we've seen, displacement should be the norm and would have to be blocked by some arbitrary stipulation. Hence, a barrier against displacement would be an imperfection. Uh, furthermore, this thesis yields at once the copy theory of displacement, illustrated in the example I gave, uh, which provides an appropriate interpretation at the semantic interface. 
And as we've just seen, the same thesis provides a solution to the puzzles of structure independence, an overarching principle of language design. Now, these are, I think, quite significant results of a kind hitherto not attained, or in fact even contemplated in the rich tradition of linguistic uh, inquiry, uh, further inquiries which I cannot review here, uh, carry the account further. Uh, looking further, there's substantial evidence that externalization is the primary locus of the complexity, variability, mutability of language. And correspondingly, mastering the specific mode of externalization is the main task of language acquisition. And mastering the phonetics and phonology of the language, its morphology, and its lexical idiosyncrasies. We might proceed to entertain another bold but not implausible thesis that generation of the semantic interface is uniform among languages, or very nearly so. In fact, realistic interpretations, uh, realistic alternatives, are not easy to imagine in the light of the fact that the systems are acquired on the basis of little or no evidence as even the few simple examples illustrate. There is a neurological and psycholinguistic evidence to support these conclusions. A research conducted in Milan a decade ago, initiated by Andrea Moro, who briefly described them before, showed that nonsense systems keeping to principles of universal grammar principles of structure dependence, uh, these elicit normal activation in the language areas of the brain. But much simpler systems using linear order in violation of universal grammar yield diffuse activation, implying that the subjects are treating them as a puzzle and not a language. Now, there's confirming evidence by Neil Smith and Ianthi Simply in their investigation of a cognitively deficient but linguistically gifted subject, he was able to master the nonsense language, satisfying structure dependence, but he was unable to master the simpler one using the computation involving linear order. Uh, Smith and Simply also made the interesting observation that normals can solve the problem of the language violating universal grammar if it is presented to them as a puzzle, but not if it's presented to them as a language, which presumably activates the language faculty. Now, these studies suggest very intriguing paths that can be pursued in neuroscience and experimental psycholinguistic. Uh, notice that these Conclusions about language architecture undermine a conventional uh, contemporary doctrine that language is primarily a means of communication, which evolved from simpler animal communication systems. Uh, if, as the evidence strongly indicates, even externalization is an ancillary property of language, then specific uses of externalized language, as in communication, are an even more peripheral phenomenon. That's a conclusion also supported by other evidence, I think. The language appears to be primarily an instrument of thought, very much in accord with the spirit of the tradition. There is no reason at all to suppose that it evolved as a system of communication. A reasonable surmise today, I think, is that within the narrow time frame suggested by the available facts, some small rewiring of the brain yield, yielded the modified basic property, the property that specifies that a language produces a, a generative, it's a finite generative system yielding 
an unbounded array of hierarchically structured expressions that provide information to the semantic interface and only as a secondary aspect the yield externalization. Of course, this happens in an individual who is then uniquely capable of thought, reflection, planning, inference, and so on, in principle without bounds. In the absence of external pressures, the basic property should be optimal as determined by laws of nature, rather the way a snowflake takes its intricate shape. The mutation might proliferate to future generations, uh, possibly coming to dominate a small breeding group, which is what our ancestors were. Uh, at that point, externalization would become valuable. The task would be to map the products of the optimally designed internal system to sensory motor systems that had been present for hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, that map mapping poses a hard cognitive problem, which can be solved in many ways, each of them complex, all of them mutable, very much what we observe, as I mentioned earlier. And carrying out these tasks might involve little or no evolutionary change. If these reflections are on the right track, then the primary task for linguistic research is to fill in the huge gaps in this picture, that is to show that the vast array of phenomena in the humanly accessible languages can be explained properly in something like these terms. And remaining in the domain of mystery for the moment, perhaps forever, is the origin of the atoms of computation, the concepts that are used in computation, which are very specific to humans, and also the nature of the puppeteer, the creative aspect of language use that was the prime concern of the long and rich tradition that has been revived in a new form in the generative biolinguistic enterprise. Uh, to add a final personal remark, uh, in my own student days in the late 1940s, at the height of the structuralist behaviorist period, it seemed as though the major problems of the study of language had been pretty much solved and that the enterprise, though challenging, was approaching a terminal point that could be fairly clearly perceived. The picture could, today could, be, could not be more different and also more exciting, not least because of the mysteries that lie beyond, perhaps forever. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chomsky, for this lecture, for this beautiful, rich, and stimulating and exciting speech. And uh, very first, to be surprised by the variety of questions that are strictly intertwined when it comes to language, to logic, mathematics, uh, philosophy, neurology, biology. So everything combines to explain the simple fact that we experience all the time, it remains mysterious, it is human ability, this generative process, an enterprise better, that uses limited means, but that uh, sort of entails endless possibilities. This sounds like a paradox. Uh, 
It's a, a possibility of infinite in fi with finite means. So this is a typical human ability, as it was perfectly explained both by Andrea and Noam. So there's nothing like that in other species. So this is something unique that then sort of is epitomized by every individual. So it's not determined by the circumstances, but somehow sort of predisposed by the circumstances, but then always unexpected and unexpected. And then what Andrea said about the fact that first and foremost, words sort of have a sound in the brain. So they are related to sound waves, even if uh, no word is uttered, they generate sound waves anyway. So men and women have this ability, and this is a given. This is something that we get, it's a heritage, it's a, a proof, it's evidence of our very same existence, but in order to fully trigger these uh, mechanism we need a relationship otherwise that would remain latent that would remain a possibility but there is something that then makes it possible so these free and creative use of language and professor chomsky remains a mystery and maybe it will remain a mystery forever because the painter, the painter mirroring his face into a mirror and self-painting himself, it's sort of uh, absolutely unreachable. So we can uh, sort of study the strings and the puppet, but what's inside the minds of the puppeteer remains a, mis remains a mystery. And as Professor Chomsky said, this holds true not just for the language, but for every free deed of man. Again, so there is uh, an uh, ineliminable mystery, a limit, a lack in terms of understanding of our nature, of our same nature. And so uh, we had the student and the master here today together. These lack, these limit should not be seen as a frustration. It's not a return to irrational, not at all. It would be much more irrational to say or to consider that our ability to understand nature is endless. So, I mean, this limit, this lack actually is a fascinating element of reality, as the few last words of uh, Professor Chomsky's speech expressed. So again, this endeavor is still underway. It's uh, very complex, but still this underscores and enhances this ineliminable mystery that still attracts us and stimulates us that very same lack that we experience also in this sector. So again, even when it comes to research, lack is always a key driver. So we keep on searching, we keep on studying, we keep on looking for the meaning and beauty of, in everything. Thank you very much, Professor Chomsky. Thank you for your participation. Thank you very much indeed. And thank you also for your patience and commitment. Thank you.